Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Demo Jam uh, for Zometry. My name is Greg Paulson, and we got a lot to cover. Today, we are talking about AM processes that do not require support structures and kind of show you a sampling of some of these processes and uh, tell you the benefits of them and how they differ from another, a lot of other traditional AM processes. So a quick introduction on myself. Again, I am Greg Paulson. I'm the Director of Application Engineering at Zometry. Uh, over my career, I've built a whole lot of parts over multiple manufacturing processes, uh, from additive manufacturing, about a dozen different additive processes, uh, to traditional manufacturing, such as machining, molding, sheet metal. Uh, so what I offer is perspective. Uh, when you look at different technologies, I'm not just selling one or the other, I look at what works really well for these projects. I also note that you know I am a big fan of these processes that I'm discussing today, uh, because I find that in the rapid prototyping to, to end-use production for non-cosmetic parts, uh, these tend to be the 80-90% uh, tool that you can use because they can be built with batches and they can be uh, fairly affordable. So let's go ahead and get started. As we're jumping into things, I want to give some perspective on what Zometry does and why we are really good about talking about these different technologies. Uh, we have this platform that lets you upload a 3D model, get instant pricing and lead times on a, over a dozen manufacturing processes. Uh, so what it's actually doing is interpreting that 3D model. It actually sometimes looks at the design and tries to guess what process you design that part for. You can always configure along the way with this instant quoting engine. We also have some really cool tools, uh, including free CAD add-ins for Inventor, Fusion 360, and SolidWorks, where you can access some of Zonofree's technology. But we're able to let you specify exactly what you need for your custom manufacturing project and then when you press buy, we take care of the rest. We have an entire production network of suppliers that is able to do your work securely and on time and to your specifications. And in the additive manufacturing realm, we offer over seven different additive manufacturing technologies from PolyJet, SLA, Carbon DLS, FDM, DMLS, SLS, and HPMJF. That's a lot. You can pause if you want here, but just to show you, we do have a lot of uh, technologies and these are all industrial additive. And again, this is about technologies that don't require support. So I want to start with why may technologies require supports in the first place? And if you look here, actually a lot of additive does require support structures. So why are supports needed in 3D printing? Well, you are growing a part usually from a base, like a base plate and forming the part from the bottom to the top. Uh, this base plate is needed because if you just put material typically in free form state without anything underneath it or without adhering to something, uh, that material usually will curl as, as there's differentiations in the temperature of what it's touching versus the material as it's coming out usually in a heated form or as it's carrying it's exothermic. Um, these support structures help anchor that in place so you get feature definition, you get something that you can build off of, hence that 3D printing or additive aspect of additive manufacturing. And also you can generate things like overhang. So if you have a feature that goes up and then has features going out perpendicular to the vertical, um, uh, vertical direction, Right now, like if you don't have support structures, there wouldn't be anything for that material to actually be rested on top of to cure in place. So support structures are made to help that material actually cure in place and get the design intent from your 3D model, and then they're typically removed afterwards. This image here shows uh, metal 3D printing, direct metal laser sintering. Uh, this is aluminum part. But actually, if you look at this, uh, this piece here, all that lattice work is actually a sacrificial support structure. And the final piece is actually this little flat uh, flange looking piece here. But to get all those features to form, you have to angle it and tilt it in a way to get these supports generated. So you can see sometimes, depending on the complexity of the part, there actually sometimes more support structure than there actually is part in the final uh, rendition. So some of these downsides, and on the side here, I'm going to have uh, a, a very quick time lapse of a FDM 3D print being post, uh, broken out, and this is actually with soluble support structure, but just to kind of show you here. But yeah, support structures, they do increase labor per part. Every every part is a little bit of a custom job to remove that material. Uh, it, there's also visual markings. So on that DMLS print, you may see a grid like stippling or small little protrusions where the support still remains and or some sand marks where you try to smooth it out so it looks different than the rest of the naturally grown material. Um, and it does restrict some feature sets. So when I have to think about how do I get the support out of here, I may design in a different way than if I had if I had more of a freeform choice, for example, with materials that do not require support structures. Uh, and the other thing too is from a build and throughput standpoint, 
I have to build off that base plate, which means all my parts have to sit beside each other. And uh, a lot of people are like, yeah, well, of course I do. But I'm going to teach you that with some of these technologies, that's not necessarily the paradigm. So again, we offer all these additive technologies. And we talked about, yeah, a lot of these do require support structures, but some don't. So let's jump into those. This is Selective Laser Sentry and HP Multi-Jet Fusion. SLS and HP MJF. How do they build without support structures? Uh, well, they're both powder bed fusion processes, which is a heated chamber, and this is the big thing here. These chambers are typically heated to, are heating the materials, the chamber, the ambient temperature, up to right below where the melting point is for these materials. So you know how I mentioned when you have uh, parts that require support structures, and when they cure in place, how they may bend or deflect. But when you keep that heat high enough and elevated enough, when that uh, material fuses together, so I'm using a laser, I'm using a heat bar and some, uh, um, some of these uh, compounds, these detailing inks, to actually cure these materials in place, uh, when that fusion occurs, instead of getting a curl and warping up because it's on cold powder, that powder is already heated, so it just stays in place. So layer by layer, you're getting materials fused together, including that fusion in the Z direction for that 3D shape, and uh, it's building from the bottom to, to the top, and you're actually getting parts that do not require support structures. Those parts are instead suspended in uncentered powder, which allows them to stay in their place, and then as they cool down, as an entire heated block of material called cake cools down, um, it could then be post-processed via a standardized bead blasting. So the post-process for all these batch-based production is very standardized versus individually stripping off support structures per part or having even a machine path if you're talking about metal 3D printing, for example. And here's some uh, support for you build examples. So these are typical build setups. In this case, these are sets of parts, but they could be uh, fully mixed varietals of parts as well. Um, usually, uh, you know, in any given job, I actually was auditing a job the other day. We had 144 parts in a SLS build, over 20 different customer uh, orders within that. So again, a very high mix amount of work. But you can see here, since I'm not constraining that base plate, I can just stack and nest and keep these parts usually about two millimeters away from each other, uh, give or take, depending on the, how thick they are. Uh, but you can see I can actually pack a lot of parts, and these builds are typically uh, 20 to 30 hour cycle times. What else can I do, right? I have, um, I can freeform my design. I have less restrictions. I could be more complex than my lattices. Um, this, this case here, this is actually a multi-jet fusion printed chainmail piece, uh, but it's you know very unique because I don't have to worry about oh I have to now pick out all the support structure. I could just print design with a little bit more intent behind it. I'm also able to use real polymers. Uh, and these are real high performance. They don't degrade over time via UV exposure like some may, uh, and they can really withstand the, the test and extremely durable. And again, you saw those, uh, those build profiles. This is also great for low volume production. I usually call it the rule of the fist about a part the size of my fist or smaller is a great uh, uh, size constraint for something that's production viable because so you could usually fit you know, about 100 of those pieces within a single build. Uh, and, and really increase your throughput. And sometimes if there's, if there's C shapes or other shapes that can nest within each other, you can just pack so many parts within uh, a single build there. Just let's talk through briefly some material spotlights. And again, these are materials specific to these technologies that we're talking about today. When I talk about multi-jet fusion, when I talk about SLS, you're gonna see nylon 12 and you're gonna see nylon 11 mentioned a lot. This is because they have a very tight thermal window for melting, which means that I can keep it in a heated state then just use a little bit of laser or heat power, uh, power to convert it to a melted state, at which point, uh, with a little bit of change of heat, it'll recrystallize and stay in that shape. Why do I want that? Well, because if it was, if it had a wider melt window, it would stay liquid for longer, and you'd actually lose feature definition on the edges of those parts. So nylon 12 and nylon 11 have this narrow melt window that allows me to have better detail on these parts and also, it's just a very nice performance material as it is. Um, some notes between the two. Uh, in general, nylon 11 is far more ductile than nylon 12, even when nylon 12 does have nice durability and ductility to it. Nylon 11 typically outperforms it. Also, something to note is that nylon 11, unlike a lot of additive polymers, is derived from a renewable source, uh, so castor bean oil. And uh, it's really important when you think about sustainability in the long run, is we, we tend to see nylon 11 adopted as you start moving from prototyping to production range, um, has a little bit of greener output, and also that higher level of durability tends to work really well uh, if you're looking for something that's going to go into the hands of a lot of consumers there. 
Um, with these materials, you also see that sometimes they are filled. So uh, glass fill, aluminum fill, mineral fill, carbon fill. Uh, so this is the same base material with some sort of filler to enhance a property. What diminishes typically is going to be that elongation before break um, and the, the flexural. Like it's gonna, it may be stiffer, so it may actually have a higher flexural modulus, but the flex, the amount of the flex you can get before a failure mode um, is, is going to be less than the unfilled materials, which will be much more ductile to them. Uh, so mineral fill, for example, enhances uh, heat deflection temperature very, very high, up to about 365 Fahrenheit. Uh, carbon fill is actually a fantastic, it's actually one of our most pre premium materials for SLS, and it's stag dissipative, uh, and it greatly enhances that stiffness. So like I said, the flex is less and the stretch is less compared to unfilled, but the amount of effort it takes to actually do that flex and stretch is a whole lot more uh, with these uh, different fill materials. And this is just a brief summary showing some of these technologies. And I threw in metal binder jetting as well, uh, specifically because metal binder jetting uh, does actually suspend parts. You can get increased complexity out of it. But with metal binder jetting, one of the notes is that it has a secondary process and secondary curing to it. So it's not a direct print method like multi-jet fusion and SLS, where SLS multi-jet fusion, I can usually get within a few uh, days lead time because I'm setting my build, building my parts, cooling, and then uh, post-processing uh, with, uh, with binder jet metal you have a longer lead time because it has so many secondary processes afterwards, including some hand finishing, et cetera, to it. But you can see here, you've got a decent variety of materials, and all these materials you see right now are available uh, online through Zometry. So some really quick tips, and then we're just going to um, finish up this uh, demo jam here. Uh, as built, they are powder bed fusion processes. You tend to get a powder bed-like finish to them. So it's matte or sugar cube-like. Uh, you get near net shapes. Uh, you get a great or a good detail resolution. Uh, really small text tends to blend together, but overall, like it's very good uh, as a general purpose material. Like usually better than you know much better than FDM, a little bit more coarse than uh, than SLA. Finishing uh, some some advanced finishes have uh, come out in the last few years, including uh, vapor smoothing. So you can see uh, this this picture here on the left hand side is a dyed black uh, multi diffusion part. On the right is a vapor fuse then dyed black, and you can see. An enhanced level of, I wouldn't call it polishing, but it brings it to almost a semi gloss, which is really nice. It also gives better mechanical characteristics as it seals the surface and decreases uh, micro stress points across it. We could do um, uh, media tumbling. We could, as we mentioned, we could dye these materials, uh, hand finish, uh, even nickel plate uh, to these materials. Some other design tips you do have some design tips. They're less uh, than something with support structure, uh, but uniformity, because this is a thermal process, is really important. Uh, reducing can waivers, again, it has to do with the uniformity of the thermal process. Anything that has a long aspect ratio to it can't actually deflect or warp. It's just something to note about that. The larger, the broader the surface of the part is, uh, the less of a candidate it is for a process like this. And it may be better for FDM where it's strapped down to a build, to, build tray and won't be able to uh, actually uh, you know, move or deflect out of place. Um, you can take advantage and you should take advantage of high levels of complexity uh, with this although it's very design forgiving. So even from a prototyping standpoint, if you design for machining or injection molding, you could probably just uh, drag and drop, select one of these processes and press print and get a pretty good example of your part from there. Um, and if you wanna learn and take a deeper dive into each one of these processes, we have fantastic guides and videos uh, on our website about every single manufacturing process that we have. So on that note, by the way, here's our design guides. Uh, so go to zombie.com forward slash resources. You can select through. Um, our design guides. I also would recommend our capabilities pages are really thorough uh, per unique manufacturing process. We also have a fantastic complete guide to 3D printing uh, that I would love for you to check out. And it's it's more like a chapter-based novel, uh, really, but it has a lot of information if you're just learning about technologies, especially if you're thinking from the process standpoint, what type of machines are used, etc. cetera. Uh, definitely check out that guide. And that's what I have for today. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something about different technologies. Again, there's there's so much you can do on the industrial stage, and sometimes you don't know about this information because you may have been working with more desktop models or things that do not have this level of design freedom to them. Take advantage of it. Zometry uh, has its according on these, and these two processes are some of the least expensive additive manufacturing processes out there because they are batch-based, so you're only really buying that space that you're reserving in the machine for your part. Uh, and you can see that. Add, add some more quantities to it, compare between SLS and MJF, you'll really see how the pricing changes and updates. In fact, uh, feel free to take $25 off. If you go to our quoting site right now, upload your parts, you get some pricing. 3D Print 25 can be used as a promotion code at the checkout page. Thank you guys so much. And uh, feel free to reach out with any questions or go check out Zometry's booth and say hello. Thanks so much.